Okay, now the other point that, that Norm made um, is the immense energy. I, I shouldn't say the other point he made. He made lots of points, but the other one that got me was the incredible amount of energy you're talking about uh, when these things impact. Um, uh, I'll try to illustrate this a little bit graphically. If you take a picture, a nice scene somewhere out west, say, uh, and you can see a little mountain range here, let's just say that's something like, uh, you know, 20 miles away, 18 or 20 miles away on a fairly clear day. Uh, let's now take a cross section of that and now everything below that line is below ground, if you will, okay? Just picture we, we, we're just looking underground across there. And an asteroid comes in, and uh, what I've picked is, again, because of the dinosaurs are a very popular subject, so I picked a 10 kilometer diameter asteroid. Uh, that's actually Ida, but it's not 10 kilometers, but I've made it 10 kilometers. It comes ripping right through the atmosphere, and whether there's water here or not makes no difference to it at all. The speed is so high. You're talking coming in at something like mm, 35,000 miles an hour, something like that. Uh, and when it hits, uh, generally speaking, objects moving that fast are going to go down into the solid Earth about four times their own diameter. So before that asteroid came to a screeching halt, and it's a real screeching halt, it's down in the solid Earth, 40 kilometers, 25, 28 miles down in the Earth. Okay, now if you think of something moving that fast, and in two seconds, going from 36,000 miles an hour to zero, you can imagine the amount of heat that that generates and shock and of course, it shocks all the ground around here. This arrow, by the way, is out at the distance of that ridge, you know, 25 miles away or so. Okay, that object gets down there, and the amount of heat that is in there, in that rock, turns hotter than the surface of the sun, a good bit hotter than the surface of the sun. And of course, it explodes, and that's the 100 million megatons of explosive power. When that happens, something down there, that deep explodes, it takes out a cone of Earth with it as it explodes, breaks it into everything from gas, it gasifies, it just vaporizes a lot of it, but the rest of it, it turns into everything from dust to pebbles to rocks to boulders to mountains. The volume that we're dealing with here in a cone of that kind, first of all, as I said, we're standing you know, maybe 20 miles away, something like that. So we're up in the air. We're, in other words, it, it, it reaches this far. The volume of that cone is about 30 plus Mount Everest. And what it's done is it takes that stuff and it throws it out into space. Some of it, a small amount of it, actually ends up escaping. It's greater than escape velocity. It goes back out into space. And that's not this object. That's Earth that gets thrown out into space. And the rest of it gets thrown on ICBM-like trajectories. I mean, you know what an ICBM does, okay? It launches, it goes up in a, in a suborbital trajectory, uh, an ellipse, and it ends up coming back to Earth a continent away or a couple of continents away. And uh, while this is a communication diagram, <laughs> it nevertheless illustrates what we're talking about. So you can picture literally now, let me just say the, the mass. I mean, I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers, but 10,000 billion tons of material is what gets excavated and thrown out. And uh, the result then is literally billions of particles of all different sizes getting thrown out into space and coming down all around the world. So in addition to, and in fact far more important than the tremendous shock wave and the, and the tsunami that's created and that kind of thing, which are all relatively local, what happens beginning nearby relatively soon, but anywhere in the world within 45 minutes, is you have coming down through the atmosphere these tons and tons and tons of rock, boulders, and everything else. 
And that's raining down, literally, all over the planet. And of course, like a shooting star, when this stuff comes down through the atmosphere at orbital velocity, it heats up, it ignites, it makes a flash, but now you've got so many of them, the whole sky turns to about 1,500 degrees. The result of that is that everything on the ground that is combustible bur bursts into flame. And so in addition to the tremendous shock and all of the rest of it, all around the whole planet, you now have global fires which put smoke and, and, uh, and carbon into the atmosphere. So that's the kind of environment that, that occurs after one of these large impacts. Now obviously with a small impact, you don't have that kind of global phenomena. But when you have the big ones, you can appreciate why not only the dinosaurs, but 70% of all life got wiped out when that happened uh, 65 million years ago. Um, now, what got to me in Norm's lecture more than what I've just told you, uh, and it's probably because I'm a you know, technical person and I really have a, a, a gut feel after a while for thermodynamics, and one of the things that Norm pointed out as sort of a throwaway was that the sky ends up so hot, not only do things just burn, you know, flash into, uh, into spontaneous combustion, but about, with the Chicxulub impact, with the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, about one meter of seawater boiled off. Okay, now if you think about three feet of water, just put, think of a pot a foot deep on your stove, and think of how much heat it takes to get that boiling, one, and then to boil it all the way down till it pan, the pan is burning on the bottom, right? That's evaporating that much water. Now multiply it by three to make it a meter deep, and now make it the width of the world, okay? The amount of energy involved in boiling off one meter of the world's oceans is just, it got me. I mean, so I was hooked at that point, you know, this is something I'm interested in. 